so we are now taping. Uh, suggestion that when we open the uh, microphone to those of you who have questions or solutions, uh, would you please come up and into the microphone uh, talk directly because we don't have another floor mic and then you will be recorded on the tape. And at that time when you do come up, your name, where you're from, please. That will give us a little bit of an idea uh, when you listen to the tape later, who did what. Um, just out of curiosity, how many of you are going to be doing classes during 1982, during this year? Great. Everybody. So you're all vitally interested. My name is Bob Osgood and Cal Golden here on my left. And we're both sorry that our third member of the team, Al Brundage, uh, got called away and is in uh, San Francisco today to the funeral services of Bob Page. And so Kel and I, together with you, will hit this subject of motivation. Uh, what is motivation? What, what is it that makes the caller want to do a better job? What, is it, what are his motivation points? Are his goals those of getting through a lot of material? Or is his goal to try to develop good square dancers, good attitudes? We'll find out as we go along. And in the short period of an hour and a half, I can imagine we'll cover quite a bit that is interesting. Let me just quickly read the summary of what the executive committee has given us in our topic. The important subject will deal with a philosophical approach to the teaching and, let's see, to uh, teaching and classes, it says, uh, it will address the problems from an ad attitudinal approach and not necessarily from the figures and terms approach. This, too, could be a reason why people stay or drop out of the classes, the attitude of the caller and his approach to class. And we are looking for floor discussions as adding much to this. Um, Cal, because this is going to be a very loose knit type of thing. Would this be a good time to bring Carl Anderson up and ask him for some viewpoints or would you like to kick off first on the subject of motivation? Carl was up late last night, maybe I ought to kick off. Cal Golden. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, when we talk about teaching and when we talk about people coming and learning from us, I personally feel that teaching square dancing is the backbone of this activity. And it's it's a great responsibility and it can be a lot of fun and certainly rewarding. But I often hear teachers tell me, say, gee, it's a snap. My wife is a school teacher, and I've been teaching some 35 years in different respects of different activities and things. And I find when a teacher really does a good job, there's a lot of work involved in it. Maybe not behind the microphone at the time he's teaching, but in the background before he gets to the microphone. One of the things that we feel that will help keep people in this activity is the caller's self-motivation and also the caller's attitude. When these people come to you to learn, there's a lot involved in that. They've never been in a square dance hall before. They've never held hands with someone else. According to the statistics that we've turned up lately, 90% of the people in the world are shy and bashful and lonesome. They need your help. You must be motivated yourself. You must set a good example for the dancers to follow if you're going to keep them in the class. One of the things that will help you, I feel, retain these people in our square dance activity is everything you do with these new students be positive thinking. I know none of you people here or people listening to this tape would ever get up in front of a class and say, well... I really don't like this particular basic, but it's on the list, so we'll show it to you. <laughs> Folks, you don't do that. If Keep your personal feelings out of this. We're looking at the total program. When you get up to teach people a basic, approach it from this way. Folks, you remember how much fun that was last week when you learned this one. Well, let me tell you something. You're going to enjoy this one even more. It fits right in with what we've already taught. And you get the people worked up to looking forward to this. This will fit in with other things we're going to teach. What we are saying is this. If you do it, do it well and do it positively. And do it with enthusiasm. I had a little note here about myself here. I was calling a dance recently. Things weren't going too well. 
And I said, Lord, what's the matter with those dancers out there? I went to the bathroom and I looked in the mirror and I found out right away what was wrong with the dancers. I went back out with a different attitude. I went back out motivated. I was tired. You can't relay this to the dancers. When you pick up that microphone, remember what Dale Carnegie says. Think about one thing at a time. And the one thing you want to think about when you pick up that microphone and put that record on is, I'm motivated. I'm ready. I'm eager. Even though you may not feel it, but you can change that around. I would like, I'll give you just one example of what I'm talking about. I got this from Norman Vincent Peale. Let me ask you a question. Would any of you care to write down on a piece of paper all your thoughts for one day and share that with your loved one? <laughs> Why are you smiling and why are you shaking your head? Maybe we need to clean up our act a little, huh? We must think positive if we want people to react to us positive. One of the things that we do, we let the people know we're happy that they're there. Every week, not just one week and let it go. And here's something that Sharon and I do. Uh, she don't do this with the greatest enthusiasm, but the main thing is she does it behind the scene and the people don't see this little part here. But she really does it, though. When a couple don't show up, we write them a card and say, Hey, we missed you last week. Hope nothing was wrong. In the first three weeks of any class we do, we send them all cards. Thank you for coming. Really looking forward to next week. I can guarantee you that we've retained these people by being motivated ourselves. I could go on all day, but I think we want to hear from some of you folks out there. But look, learn your lesson well. Learn exactly what you're going to teach there. And when you're there and you pick up that microphone, make the people feel that they are welcome. Another thing is this. Compliment the dancers. Say, hey, you're, even though you may be stretching it just a little, <laughs> tell them how great they look. Hey, you really done that good. You know, they stand up a little straighter and they say, gee, if i done that good, the next one I'll do better. You see, in other words, it's an attitude situation. Please consider this. You may applaud any time you feel necessary. <laughs> <laughs> we, I'm sure with a start like that, we'll keep everybody awake. Now, as you're hearing these things that are being said, they're bringing to mind things that you would like to contribute and that bring questions that you might have about how, how do you accomplish some of these things that Cal or others may be talking about. I think one of the things that is very important to a caller is sensitivity, uh, a feeling of oneness. This, of course, gets over in one respect to the other sessions that are being held, one of them might be the caller's partner. There is a sensitivity feeler out there in the caller's partner. If it's a man caller, it would be his wife. And that sensitivity tells the caller, okay, your teach is a little fast. You're, you're maybe missing the point with the people. Maybe unknowingly you were sarcastic. Maybe this is a time in this particular class to slow down a bit. Or the class is particularly alive tonight, you can move ahead a little bit. So sensitivity to the job is very important. Uh, teach by telling and teach by doing. Call by teaching or doing and call by doing. In other words, if you tell somebody a way to do a figure, and you, then you dance when there might be a guest caller and you don't stick to the things that you've taught. Or it's a case of do as I say but don't do as I do. Your Part of your teaching is going to be down the drain. So by motivating the people, you're setting the example of what you want them to do. Um, Cal, I mean, uh, it's Carl, isn't it? That Carl, you've got some experience in this. We'd like to start out by getting the voice of the of the audience. So, Carl, come on up here. And, yeah, uh, if you will tell you where you're from, Carl, and uh, you've got a few minutes here on this mic, and move right in. My name is Carl Anderson, Oklahoma. I've been admonished to take uh, sh the short end of that very few minutes. So, the the one thought that I would like to share is, uh, in terms of motivation and the teaching process is regardless of how many times we have been through the teaching process in terms of teach, and this relates a little bit to Bob's sensitivity uh, comment, those people that we have there in the class, this is their first time. And I think that many times we lose track of that side, side of, that, of that fact. 
And, and another thing that, that I, would, I would like to, to impress is that we have one opportunity in a teaching-learning mode. We have the one shot, and that's during classes. True, we have workshops and that sort of thing. But in, in terms of the real teaching-learning psychological set, we have the one shot, and it's that one shot during the classes. They have been recruited, the dancers have. They are eager. They are receptive. They are there as a learner. You have many, most of the qualities that exist in a teaching-learning process. And if we, if we blow it at that time, that one single time, when the, when the mental, mental set is correct, we may have blown it for a long time to come. So remember that, in my opinion, when, when you're teaching, even though you've gone through it 300 times, it's their first time, and this is the only time that you're going to have the, all of the correct psychological settings for a very effective behavior modification activity of the learning teaching process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carl. Yes, sir. Uh, if you, oh, come on up and identify yourself. And uh, this gentleman is wearing a brown suit. Uh, those of you are listening to the thing, and uh, he's got a beard. Go ahead. <laughs> I would like to talk, uh, you're right, thank you, Bob. My name's Pete Ellis, and I'm from New Hampshire. I would like to talk to you about a concept called common vision. Oops, big word. Don't worry about it. Okay, we're going to do just that. The way you motivate your dancers is by you having a common vision. And I'd like to ask a question, I'd like nobody to answer it. When you're about, I want you to answer to yourself, when you're about to put that needle on the record, to teach that tip to your beginners, what are you thinking about? What happened when you come in? Maybe an argument with your wife? Whatever. What should you be thinking about? Let me give you a suggestion. How many of you have ever danced in a tip that was as close to perfect as you've come to? All of us have one time or another. The collar was on, the music was right, the other seven people in the square were right on the money, and you just float through that square. It's the greatest joy you'll ever see. And, and we're, this is what we're trying to get to those people, isn't it? Put that in your head. Get that thought in your mind. This is my vision of this activity, and I want every tip to be like that. And your face will begin to smile. You'll begin to feel warm inside. And the minute that you do that, that microphone will pick that up and put it right out to those dancers. That's common vision. That's your vision and you're making it common to all of those people out on the floor. And if you do this, and you do it religiously, you will find that the attitude of your dancers will begin to improve, you will be motivating them to having a good time, and when those things happen, teaching goes better, learning is better, and we will make better square dancers. Thank you, Pete Ellis. Remember, as a, a caller teacher, that you have a very unique spot. And in case uh, you're ever moved by the sound of applause to the point where you begin to get a feeling of, of greatness, remember that there are two important elements in the activity. What are they? The dancer and the dance. And you, as a caller teacher, stand in between as the individual or the source that brings the two together. You are not the star. You are the person that brings a person the enjoyment, the uh, opportunity for friendship. Uh, I have two gentlemen who want to add to this. And then I want you to be thinking about what the purpose of class actually is. And we'll get a cow back here on the microphone in just a minute. But first, let me take these two callers who would like the mic. Your name, please, and where you're from. Uh, Claude Seidt, Camino, California. Uh, the name of the session is Motivate Them or Rush Them, and I feel that if we try to rush our new dancers, we're going to frustrate them. If you've got frustrated dancers, there's no way you can motivate them. So I feel that uh, any type of rushing in a new dancer's class, I don't care if you've got a class plan that is for the first 36 basics and you plan on doing it 10 weeks, if it takes 20 weeks, take 20 weeks. It may take you longer. You'll end up with a more quality class. You'll end up with a more stable class, and you'll end up with real square dancers, not people that know numbers. 
So I think that uh, motivate them and rush them, or motivate them or rush them, should have been labeled motivate them or frustrate them. Because if you can't motivate them, they're going to be frustrated. When they're frustrated, it's impossible to motivate them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claude. And uh, Ralph, why don't you come on up here? Ralph Hay? Ralph Hay from Aurora, Colorado. After teaching and calling for some 20 years, I stopped actively calling a couple of years ago, and it's given me an opportunity to get out on the floor and dance, and particularly in classes. And I've noticed a lot of things that I never noticed behind the microphone. One thing that I would caution you about is how you use your angels in teaching and in motivating. A frustrated dancer cannot be motivated. If they're frustrated, they immediately become self-conscious, they shut off their listening, uh, and you're just treading water with them and you're not making any progress. If you take the time to talk to your dancers who are going to assist you as angels in classes and stress to them the importance of dancing the way you are teaching, and it's difficult because they have habits. Uh, they'll be perhaps be, they're used to twirling people, and you may not have taught a twirl yet. And try to get them in the mode of responding exactly to what you are telling those students. And encourage them to do what you should also be doing, and that is to pat them on the back and congratulate them when they do something right. And one other thing, if you have the opportunity while you're teaching a class, to get out on the floor and dance with them, you will pick up a lot of little things that you find are happening that you can't see from behind the mic, and it will help you to stress those things those, uh, and perhaps eliminate some of the bad habits that people are beginning to pick up, things in the way of hand holes, tenseness, tight grips, hanging on to people too long on a right and left grand and pulling them back, and these kinds of things that are not so obvious from the behind the mic become very obvious if you're out dancing. And if you are out, get the chance to dance out in your class for uh, just a tip or two, perhaps while uh, a guest caller or someone else is behind the mic, it gives you the chance, too, to personally congratulate somebody after you've danced with them, and that means an awful lot to them, and you can really motivate them and bring up their spirits, and I think you'll find that those things will, will help a great deal. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. Um, I wish we had the time to tell you a little bit about each of the individuals that are coming up and sharing their thoughts because they've got terrific background. Uh, first time I ever knew Cal Golden, he was a world champion caller. It was in 1946. And we really had, in that those days, a contest for callers. And uh, Cal it was at Lloyd Shaw's classes in Colorado Springs, and Cal was in the military. I don't know if you had made uh, one stripe at that time or not, Cal, one stripe. But since that time, I've gotten to know... Come on in, please. That Since that time, we've gotten to know each other very well, and I've gotten to appreciate Cal and what he's done for square dancing. I watched what he did with the square dancers in Europe. And at the time in 1954 through 57, his activities over there did much in setting the groundwork for square dancing throughout Europe in a place that has grown tremendously today. So this gentleman has a great deal going for him in the way of motivation. And I've asked Cal to talk to you a little bit more now at this point on motivation, and then we'll have more input from the rest of you. I remember very well that Caller's College at Pappy Shaw's because uh, sometimes our coaches tell us one thing and they do something else. I had a picture made with that trophy. And I made a mistake by showing it to Pappy Shaw. And he critiqued me in front of, what, about 125 people? But I wanted to learn to call so well, I took it like a gentleman. And he said, I shouldn't have had that picture made with that trophy. And I'll never forget this as long as I live. We walked upstairs, and there was Pappy. He had his pictures laying out for sale for $1.25. And uh, I remember Pappy said, uh, do not make Spread Engine commercial. I paid him $25 to hear him say that, and that was a lot of money in those days. We need to... <laughs> I love Pappy Shaw. I was critiqued that day, and I made very sure that I did what Pappy wanted done. That way you got a good critique. Ralph Maxheimer and my good friend Bob Osgood was in the balcony as I was calling. 
No doubt about it, I was calling a little fast. So Ralph Maxheimer said, I thought Cal's tempo was too fast. I only made a remark by saying, I was watching Pappy Shaw's dancers. Pappy replied very quickly, the timing was just fine. <laughs> Mr. Osgood up there said, tell the boy to keep trying. <laughs> I appreciate that. Hey, Bob, I'm still trying. People, I, I believe in motivation. Motivation does a lot of things. And as a caller and a teacher, you must be motivated if you're going to motivate other people. I'd like to share some things with you if I could now. Some of you have heard it before, but maybe it won't hurt to hear it again. Any person who wants to achieve permanent sustaining success knows he must acquire a vast reservoir of inner strength. We must have energy. Maybe some of us are over the hill with energy and some of you younger folks sitting there got a lot of energy. We do have to have a high energy level. Determination and desire. We must have the ability to motivate ourselves. We must develop motivation because a man cannot hope to motivate others unless he is motivated himself. You can't ask your dancers to have a good time when you're saying, everybody smile please. It won't happen, folks. Now, I want all you people to have a good time tonight. Don't bother with me. I don't feel too well. The whole crowd don't feel too well then. Motivation begins with developing a personal courage, enthusiasm, know-how, confidence, and belief. Supported by a positive attitude towards his own ability, the individual is motivated to create, produce, and to achieve. What are we trying to achieve in teaching people? We want to teach them to have fun. We want to teach them some basics. We want to teach them how to dance to music. And folks, I'm very sorry. I don't like to think negative. I'm thinking positive. We need to put just a little bit more emphasis on the music. People will stay in square dancing longer if they learn to move with the music. I, I see a few callers walking these days, you know, in between the beats. Set a good example. He sets an example of motivation that is the first step towards motivating others. If you cannot dance, don't expect other people to follow. They might just do it. Make sure you dance well. When you're in a square and dancing in front of your students, how do you want your students to react? Whether you believe this or not, it's true. Take my word for it. Your dancers will take on your motivation. Your dancers will take on your attitude and your wife's attitude. Make sure it's a positive one. They stay longer. Motivation is exactly what the word means. The ability to motivate yourself to accomplishment. And we want to accomplish to teach these people how to have fun. That's what they've come there for. Please believe me. You cannot live by choreography alone. It won't sustain the dancers. They're going to leave us. And you can't sustain dancers in a dance program that can't dance to music. Put a beat on there so they can learn to move to it. Motivation is exactly what the word means. The ability to motivate yourself to accomplishments. Motivation means the development of inner strength, willpower, overwhelming desire, and the determination to reach any goal you want to achieve. You can do it if you're not presently doing it. I have a funny feeling you're doing it. Maybe you just need a little more motivation. No matter what you are, what age you may be, if you want to achieve permanent sustaining success, the motivation, the drive towards that goal must come from within. Anything comes from without won't last very long. It has to come from within. I tell you right now, I honestly mean this. I really feel that we would not be where we are today if it wasn't for this man sitting right here, Bob Osgood. Give him a hand. I've known him for 32 years. He's never wavered from the belief that this is a recreation and it should be fun. And if dancers have a good time, it's like you and your calling. It's not really what you call, it's how you call it. I'd like to give you 10 steps here to consider in our teaching and working with people. We did not just, just take these off of the wall. We did a lot of thinking about it when Bob asked me to be on this program. One, a caller must keep himself motivated at all times when you're in that classroom. You really can't let down for a minute. When you walk in that door, take a deep breath. Norman Vincent Peale says, you can't have two thoughts at the same time. 
You can't think negative and positive at the same time. So when you walk in that door, leave all the negative thoughts outside, take a deep breath and walk in with a big smile on your face. It was like we were talking about, I mentioned a while ago about Sharon being reluctant to send out these cards. She really felt at the time when we started this that really wasn't needed. We just told the people when they left, be sure and be back next week. But I want to tell you what happened. It didn't take long for her to change her mind. After she sent the cards out the first time, all the people come in the hall said, thank you for that card. It's amazing that you took the time just to remind us to be here. A lot of them, that's why they were there. You've never seen a person. She said, that really works, don't it? She's never hesitated to send the cards out anymore. Stop the tape a minute. Don't do that when you're calling. Jim Mayo, get on you for it. He must, or he, have a positive attitude about everything he is teaching. Tell the people how much they're going to enjoy it. Once again, Sharon and I send out cards in our workshop and our classes just about every week until we get them really cemented into the program. You can tell when they're not going to quit. you got a feeling for it. You can tell by their attitude. The caller's attitude about the fast and the slow dancer is important. Listen, remember this, if you would, please. The slow dancer. You know, those are the ones that you give just a little bit more attention to. And, you know, they're the ones that come and open up the hall. They sweep the floor. They make the coffee. And do you know why they love the program so much? Is because you spent just a little bit more time with them, and you showed an interest, and they're appreciative of it. If you don't believe this, listen to this. There was a gentleman in Fort Worth, Texas, had this nice little couple. Three years they went through the class. He came early. He stayed late. Three years they graduated. They walked up to Melton Luttrell and said, We'd like to do something for you and Square Dancing because the wife and I have really enjoyed this. And said, What can we do? Melton said, We need a Square Dance Hall. <laughs> and the couple said, Thank you. The next day, that little couple that he had spent extra time with, who was slow learning, called up Melton and said, How much do you think it would cost to build a hall? Melton said about $100,000. And that little couple he didn't know that were rich said, Where would you like it built? <laughs> <laughs> they got to work on the hall. They got to work on the hall, and finally the couple wrote a check for a quarter of a million dollars, and if you will go on Highway 20, it's called the Square Dance Center in Fort Worth, Texas. I would like for all of you lovely people in this audience, those out there in the tape land, Cal Golden would like to tell you up front, I'd like to have a hall built in Arkansas right away. <laughs> Don't believe in beating around the bush. Ask, you shall receive. The caller's attitude about that fast dancer needs to be considered. God bless your heart. Herb, you're good. I don't care what John says about you. I like you. The fast learner, if we don't utilize that talent, we're going to lose it. They will quit. Utilize that talent. Say, look, I've been watching you. You really learn quickly. Look, I could use your help. Would you help me? Do you know when you ask people to help you sincerely, you know, 99% of them will help you. Even in the Bible it says, ask and you shall receive. Ask them to help you with the slow learners. And you're utilizing their ability. And yet you're not slowing them down. They, they think they are going to town. And they are. Passing on information to the class about the Square Dance activity. I would like to say this. Very motivated on this, so... I hand out sets and orders, 48 basics, about the fifth week. And I want to tell you what happens. If it hasn't happened to you, it will, and I'm sure it has. The next week when the dancers come, they say, when are we going to get to number 48? You're on about 15 or 20. And I would like to warn you up front, if you're going to hand out that manual, which I recommend you do, when you vary from the teaching in that manual, you better explain why. Because <laughs> some doctor back there is going to say, Gee, you're not teaching it like it says here in the manual. Has it ever happened to you? <laughs> sure it has, hasn't it? So follow it. Keep the class aware of the fact that fellowship is the main reason for square dancing, folks. It really is. How many people stays in it? I hear people telling me something. It bothers me, folks. I, I got to tell you this. I got to stop for a minute. There, there's things in square dancing that disturb me deeply. And it's some of our callers' attitudes and some of our dancers' attitude. You're calling a good mainstream dance. Somebody comes up and says, 
When are we going to do something in plus one and plus two? You're calling a plus one, plus two. When are we going to do something in A1 and A2? Folks, we have to teach people it's not really what they dance. It's how they dance it and how much they enjoy it. If you dance a C4, I call a lot of C4. See a square and call. <laughs> That's four couples. But tell these people, teach them how to be nice to other people, how to be patient with themselves. These are the things that will sustain these dancers in our Square Dance program. Tell them about Square Dance and all over the world. Tell them why it's so important that all of us callers around the world teach the same thing the same way. So if they want to go to Australian Square Dance, they can. People, I beg you, I really do, pay heed to what Caller Lab is saying, to the fact there's hours of work. Years of work went into those two little manuals. Look, if you don't agree with it, there's a way you can get it changed. Get up out here on this floor Wednesday morning and get up and say, My name is Joe Doe. I make a recommendation we change basic so-and-so. Now, if you can sell those 700 callers, man, that's fantastic. But if you can't, you ought to go along with them, don't you think? I think there's a, yeah. But Bob can tell you, when I started Square Dance in Colorado Springs, we could not dance in Texas. We could not dance in California. We could not even dance in other parts of Colorado. Everybody had their own thing going. The thing that's brought square dancing where it is today is people like yourself working for a common cause so we can square dance all over the world. But if we let everybody, I don't mean let, if everybody does their own thing in square dancing, and we don't have a uniform teaching code, where will our square dancing be? I believe this with all of my heart. If it wasn't for Call a Lamb and all the work you people have put in, we would not be where we are today with this. Eight, nine years ago, it was getting pretty bad around the country. Everywhere you went, people were calling different things and dancing different things. And this is the man that cemented and got it together. Teach dancers to dance to music. I started an advanced workshop the other day, and I shattered them all. The first thing we did was work five minutes on boom, 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 a boom, chuck a boom, chuck a boom, chuck. They said, we've never had that before. I said, that's because you've never been to my class before. We've got a new record coming out. This is not a commercial. It's a teaching record. The first 64 beats is just nothing but boom, boom, to get the people to move. The next 64 beats will have a little boom, chuck a boom, chuck. Teach the dancers what a beat is. Teach them what rhythm is. They don't know. 90% of the people come to you have never been on a dance floor before in their lives. Do you realize the work that you have to do? You have to teach them how to hold hands. You have to teach them how to move to music. And they'll stay with us. We're just about finished. The attitude of the caller and his partners is so important in any square dance class. Tell the people about other callers. Tell them about this fantastic program we got. Hand out the indoctrination on square dancing. The fifth week, Sharon does this. They get a cup of coffee and they sit down and we go over the handout book on indoctrination of square dancing. About, you know, that you perspire a little bit more than you normally do. <laughs> so deodorant's a good idea. Don't drink and garlic and stuff like that before the dance. Some people don't always heed this. So we set a little garlic out at the front table <laughs> said, don't use me before the dance. I don't put any bourbon out there. I'm afraid somebody might drink it. <laughs> I, I do put deodorant cans there and say, you may not need me, but I need you. And it works. It really does. But your attitude about other callers. One of the things to remember this, when a dancer comes up to you sometime and says, Man, you're the greatest caller in the world. What do you think about this guy over here? He may be leading you down a lonely path to slaughter. When you speak to other dancers, speak good about your callers and about people around you. They may just be trying you out to see what your attitude is. The success of new students, for them to be successful, is so important. That will bring them back. Thank you, Bob. I wish everybody could sit down and hear Cal. But the thing is, you can do this same thing with your people. If you are impressed with the activity you're a part of, if you love square dancing, if you love the people who come to you, then you can get up and you can fire them up just like Cal is doing. Uh, not long ago, we had an occasion to be up in Santa Barbara where our kids live, and we had an evening free. So we decided to go over to a class that uh, we knew was being held at that time. So we parked the car, and as we were walking up, we heard this terrifically 
enthusiastic calling. And I said to Becky, boy, you know, that's fun. You have to want to dance when you hear that. And as we went in, this exuberant calling kept going, and here was one square. And this caller was giving his all with just one square in there. Three nights later, I went to a dance also called by Bruce Johnson with over 50 squares, the same exuberance, no difference. He loved the dancers that were there. He said, those of you who came deserve the best I've got to give. And I think that's very important for all of us. Don't regulate the tone of your voice or your attitude by the fact that there are a few people as opposed to a lot of people. These people who come deserve to have the fun just as much as, as if the hall were filled, even though there are just a few. Um, what is the goal in having a class? Um, do you want to try quickly to rush these people through so they can catch a club that exists that maybe sponsored them? Or do you want to teach the person to be a square dancer? And to my way of thinking, this is very important. In bowling... And I have nothing against any activities, bowling, golf, or anything else, but you don't perhaps benefit by knowing a background. You don't maybe need to know some of the things about golf. You just want to get out there and have a good time or in bowling, and you learn, you learn the uh, mechanics of it. And as far as square dancing goes, there is much that is different than any other activity. The purpose of square dancing, as, as I have felt since I started dancing a number of years ago, was not, the end result was not dancing itself. It was the friendliness, the fact that you could hold hands with other people, and I defy people to be too angry with people that you hold hands with. This feeling of touching your neighbor, touching people, is very, very important. And, and I think that teaching a person right from the beginning, what it is to be a square dancer, what it is to share in the fun. And I was going to say responsibilities, but sometimes responsibility has a connotation of one person doing all the work. But responsibility is sharing in the fun. Being the host at the door, greeting people, sharing in whatever it might be, this develops what I consider is the attitude of square dancing. So that you're great number of people who come in the door, the first thing they, they ask isn't how long is it going to be before I can join the club, but aren't we having a good time each night that we're here together? Sometimes our learning ability is different, and if you've had a class with mixed age people, people, some of them have been out of school, out of a learning situation for 30, 40, 50 years, and others who maybe still are in college, still are in high school, still are in a learning process, or who have just recently been in one, you'll find there is a great gap before the lights go on, before they're catching on to the things you're trying to teach them. And sometimes you as a caller have to make a decision. Shall we bypass these people who need and want square dancing just as much as everyone else here so that we can move the group ahead? Or can I adjust what I'm teaching and forget the fact that I'm not going to teach anything new. I'm going to maybe find new things to do with what they already know so that I maybe can bring the people up. Sometimes there are people where even that doesn't work. The lights are not going on. And I think one of the most moving things to Becky and me one time was watching the little couple. And you know exactly who I mean because you've had this same couple in your classes time after time. They were not getting it. Uh, we tried in the very beginning to mix the people continually. And to me, mixing people in a class situation is important because you share the wealth, you share the ability, you share the fun. And I, I like this, this idea of mixing. But this couple, even with all that, were not getting it. And we were trying to figure out, okay, what tack to take. We have known of situations where people have been told, sorry, you're not going to make it. You should drop out now and take the class next year. Or even worse, being pulled out of a square and said, don't dance anymore, you can watch. Now that, to me, is not worth, is not worth the risk. Because you're hurting somebody, and hurting one person is not worth it. 
There are ways to do this, and in this particular situation, we had used up most of our ideas, but we noticed three couples who were also in the class who were having the lights go on quicker and who were really catching it, cornering this couple. And at the end of the evening, we still didn't know what was happening, but next week we noticed that this couple was beginning to catch. These three couples had gotten this couple over to their house, and had spent one whole evening with records, and this couple was beginning to catch it. And the attitude of dancing was on the dancer's shoulders and not the caller's. And they got it because we tried to get across to them that this is an activity that you all share and we can progress together. There are so many things that are important, I feel, to tell the people in the very beginning, not just the deodorant and don't eat the garlic and all that stuff but attitudes as Cal has been telling you the positive attitude the fun the sharing all of these things are important even to the point of not feeling that the most important thing is teaching all the basics quickly to me class teaches a person the principles of body mechanics moving to music and timing and comfortable dancing and courteous dancing. Once you learn how to do a right and left through, you have learned the most difficult move in square dancing because you're doing stuff you've never done before. From that point on, you've learned to do things with your hands and body. But let's just figure that in a class of a certain number of weeks, maybe five weeks, maybe six, maybe ten, whatever it might be, a person learns how to react to a call. He, he learns these basic things about dancing. Then his ability to accept the teaching is much quicker. If we don't rush and say each night we've got a goal, we have to teach X number of movements in order to get them through in 18 weeks. We're defeating our purpose. And if indeed there are 80% of our dancers coming into our classes that will never make it into club, what a tremendous waste. What a tremendous waste. I don't know of any activity, as one person said one time, where we work so cotton-picking hard to get people in and work twice as hard to get them out. And that shouldn't happen. Are there any of you who would like to add to this, to ask questions? Please come up, identify yourself. My name is Ted Nation from San Diego, California. I'd like to talk just a minute about the slow dancer. In spite of everything we do sometimes, we'll have someone in a class that we just have a tremendous time teaching how to dance. They just don't seem to get it. One of the things that I've found is very helpful to me is that I make that slow learner my very best friend. I go talk to him find out what he does for a living, and I make sure that that guy is my friend, and I know all about him. And um, recent case, had a guy that had a lot of difficulty. Went up, talked to him, found out he's a fighter pilot, uh, has flown uh, propeller-driven aircraft and jet aircraft off of an aircraft carrier, and that was very fascinating to me. No longer was he a slow dancer out there. That was my friend, the fighter pilot, that obviously had the talent, the ability to learn how to square dance, and it became my problem. What do I have to do to help my friend learn how to dance? Thank you. Thank you, Ted. We, we say uh, that you have to come several hundred miles away from home to meet people from your own home state, and it's good to see you. Uh, we do have some more thoughts from Cal, and Cal is in a... This, did you want to dance? Or? <laughs> I'll get them right back to you in a minute. Come on. Uh, as Bob was sitting there, I, I was thinking of additional things to, to share with you. I, I love the idea of Bob saying, you know, touching hands and touching things. I felt this way extremely well last night. I thought about this quite a bit, didn't you? <laughs> Just thought I would pass that on for coffee. Boys, one thing about you folks, you're sharp. You catch on quickly. I, I would like to share something with you. You know, it's very, very hard to teach other people to be happy when you're not happy yourselves. And do you realize that a lot of people go through life very unhappy with what they're doing? L let me share this with you, please. 
If you don't learn to be happy with little things, what makes you think you will be happy with big things? It won't happen, folks. If you don't learn to get along with this person, what makes you think you'll be able to get along with the next person? It's a matter of attitude. Had a young caller recently in, in class. He said, I hate my job. I said, that's a shame. I seen him the other day, and after a week with me, he said, you know, I'm really enjoying my job. I'm going to do it good, and then I'm going to move on. Before you leave something, do it well, then move on. Don't think that you can move on, and it'll be better down the road. It doesn't get better. You've got to start here. I didn't know. Do it with the greatest compassion and all the tack and skill you got. I remember a couple in Riverside, California, 30 years ago. They were dancing, and it was pretty bad. <laughs> And I said, folks, why don't you get out of square dancing because you will never learn to dance. I've made a lot of mistakes, but I try not to repeat them. <laughs> those, those couples left and went to another caller. They're still dancing today, and they left to dance in front of me and say, hi, Cal. <laughs> <laughs> I had a change of attitude. When I have to ask a couple to leave the program, I do it in this manner. I say, folks, I won't apologize. I am not able to teach you at the same speed as the rest of the people. Could we ask you to maybe drop out of this class and we'll start over again at the next class and I'll have a little prayer that they'll take up bowling? <sighs> Some people cannot dance, folks. If you cannot move 126 beats a minute, you cannot square dance. The other thing that we'd like to do here, when we get people into square dancing and we turn off one couple, do you have any idea how many people that you've turned off in square dancing? According to the statistics, when you get one people out, one person out of square dance, you've turned off 244 other people. Okay. We have uh, we have some more input from uh, those of you, and be thinking about things you'd like to add. Or are you going to get into a session? Oh, okay. Uh, was there? <laughs> did you want to? Oh no, you're next. Come right up. Hi, Bill Addison from Maryland. One, in keeping people in square dancing, I discovered something uh, quite a few years ago, and I really don't know where I got it. But uh, I tell my beginner classes on the third night, by the third night, that each of you, and think about this for yourselves, has there been a night when you have been so frustrated in the learning situation or in a dancing situation that you've said to yourself, I wouldn't go back in a hall on a bet. I don't want any part of this. I'm not going to be this frustrated and humiliated. I got to thinking about that. I've talked to a lot of dancers over the years and a lot of callers over the years, and I have never found one who didn't have that one night. Now, in a teaching situation, you may have, you, you should warn the people that they're going to have one or more of these nights. And tell them in the beginning, hey, it's going to happen to you. When it does, recognize it for what it is because everybody goes through it. Cinch up your pucker and string and come on back the next time and you'll see just how much brighter it'll be. And I've had numerous dancers tell me after this warning, they come to me and say, you remember what you told us? Tonight was the night. But they're back. And as a result, my classes, the retention of people in my classes has increased from 75 to 98 percent. The only time I lose them is when they get sick or get transferred. Other than that, it seems to work. That's one little trick you might use to keep them in there and keep them happy. Tell them they're going to be frustrated sometime. We all are. But tell them to recognize it for what it is because it's just a temporary thing and it's going to pass and they're going to have so much more fun when they pass through it and then they can pass this on to someone else. Thank you. I don't think there's anything that motivates dancers more quickly than if they think that they are a person, that they are recognized. Uh, this, hey you, or will the third man in the square over there please do thus and so, might work all right in the very beginning. But toward the 30th night, uh, it'd be awfully nice if we knew the first name of all our people. Now, with a big class, it may not be as possible. Uh, I wish that I had the ability to know people by their name more quickly. And when I do, I, I do use their name whenever I can. 
But sometimes it's, it's unfortunate for me that I'll be with people that I may have taught years before and have been in every class and been in clubs that I call for and find that they still are not a name to me. And that is a big misgiving that I have. And I, I know some people have this tremendous ability to, to uh, learn names and keep them. One of, the, uh, one of the things that I did to try to learn this little thing about learning names and learn other things as well, uh, I would recommend to any of you who have not had the experience, a Dale Carnegie course is probably in your area. And though it has nothing to do with square dancing, it has to do with your prime product, people. And even if you just got a few things out of the course, it's worthwhile. Uh, have any of you attended a Dale Carnegie course? Great. Did you benefit from it? Did you feel that it was something that uh, you could take with you and use? I know in teaching caller schools and things like that, there are more things that come out of this. Cal quotes uh, uh, Reverend Peel and other people who are, are good philosophers, and I'm sure he quotes Mr. Carnegie too, but... Wherever you can get help, wherever you can get ammunition for working with people, the better off you are. Those of you who have been fortunate enough to be school teachers and have learned the background of teaching, how fortunate you are for this experience. Many of us, and, and this is the, the screwy thing, many of us that are up behind the microphone working with lots and lots of people, maybe more people than a school teacher ever faces, have not had a background in working with people. We pick it up. And sometimes over the microphone comes a weird sound. Shut up. I'm talking to the group. You know? What would make a person cringe quicker? I hope you knew I wasn't trying to silence it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I got your attention. Somebody said, there are many ways to get attention. If, uh, if you raise your voice, you're not going to get it. But if you lower your voice and say million dollars, sex, and things like that, the quiet the floor gets real quiet. Um, I, think, I think that sometimes, sometimes our attitude behind the microphone is a thing that we're not aware of. We may be a stellar caller. We may be able to knock them dead with our singing calls, and our timing and our patter calls may be great. But you want to do a drill sometime and really find out something important. Tape record your evening. Okay, you've done this. But you haven't done it maybe this way. As you are set up and you say, okay, set's in order, let's, let's, have, uh, let's get ready for the first tip. You turn your mic on at that time while the people are forming. Then as you put the needle on the music and you're ready to start calling, take the needle off. Then as soon as you're through calling, put the needle back on. And as long as you're on the microphone but not calling, let the, let the record, let the recording go. So that at the end of the evening, you maybe have 15 minutes of you talking to the people. Okay, how do you come across? Are you making friends as you're doing it? Are you making friends for square dancing? Or are you turning these people off so that they don't want to come next time? And I think sometimes that is an awfully good way to find out something for yourself that maybe nobody else will tell you. Okay, we have another visit to the mic. Come on up here. And the rest of you, if you'd like to come, just get in the line either side. It's the same brown jacket and the same beard, but it's Pete Ellis again from New Hampshire. I uh, would like to pass along something that worked for me with some slow couples. Um, I couldn't teach this couple to dance. It wasn't that they couldn't learn. I couldn't teach them. I had the luxury of four or five other classes in the area. And we got them into the other classes. I would caution you not to send them, because then you are sending them away. I called the other caller, and I said, I need a favor. Would you come over, meet this couple, and invite them to come and dance with you? I'm telling him first what he was getting into. He did, and uh, this particular couple in mind turned out to be one of the better dancers once he had worked with them, and they now support both he and me, and we have, uh, this has really worked out well for us. If you have that luxury, use it. If I may, I'd like to add something to Bob said, um, and I'm not sure where this quote 
came from. I uh, Actually not. I, I really think it was Ed Gilmore, but I'm not absolutely sure. But the quote goes that as callers, if we would measure our success by the width of the smiles instead of the number of the smiles, we'd be much better off. Beautiful. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Bill Peters made a remark one time. How can you determine if you are successful as a teacher and a caller? By watching the dancer's feet. If they're coming in, you're all right. If they're going out, you got a problem. <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. One of the things we hear a lot of callers saying, Gee, said, I had six couples last week. Had to have two set out. Don't do that. You know, you can dance two couples square. Ninety-nine percent of the things you can do with eight people, you can do with two. So don't have them. Everybody asks me, you know, we're getting number conscious anymore. You call a dance somewhere. The people don't come up and say, gee, did the folks have a good time last night at your class? They come up, how many did you have? So we all want to sound good. So what I do anymore when I have a small, cl a small crowd, I make them into many squares, and I tell everybody I had double what I really had. <laughs> That's not storing now. That's, that's just elaborating on what went on at the dance. And it makes you feel better. Would you please consider these two things here very seriously? The word in the world and the word with your life and teaching is balance. You've got to have a balance in everything we do. We teach people to square dance. And this is where we spend most of our time. But we need to spend some time on teaching people how to be square dancers. There's a big difference there. How to get along with people. How not to walk past the square when somebody's got their hands held up. How to always be friendly to other people. And all the things that they need to do, the list would be quite lengthy if we had time to go over it. Remember, teach them to dance. You've got to teach them to dance to music. The basics and how to hold their hands and things like this. But you need to teach them how to be square dancers. And I guarantee you this will retain them in this program. Thank you, Cal. This is Walt Cole. Sound like Bob Osgood. No, this is Walt Cole from Utah. <clears throat> I know as Cal's gotten a little conservative over time, I thought he'd come up with a new uniform after last night to dress... <laughs> No, I, I think, too, some of this are, is exchange of tricks of the trade, whether they're successful or not. Uh, I guess it depends on, on your own evaluation. But in teaching new dancers, uh, I'm too cheap to buy Osgood's hand, handouts, so I make my own. And for the night's lesson and whatever movements I'm going to teach, I give the title in a handout, the number of beats that it takes to execute that movement, the description of, or the definition of the movement and uh, the formation from which it's done. Now, this seems like quite a big order for new dancers, and uh, whether it's a circle to the left or where we're in to spin chain through. Over the weeks of teaching, they come up and ask for them. Where's the handout tonight? Okay, you may have two movements on there and only get around to teaching one. You'll say, okay, I'll teach the next one next week or when we're ready for it. The other thing I like to do is I don't think we really know where we're going until we know where we've been. And during the course of the evening of teach, not every night, but when the opportunity presents itself, I sit down and say, hey, <clears throat> do you guys know uh, about Henry Ford? Or do you know about Pappy Shaw? Or then we start building it up into etiquette, just a five-minute little conversation with the class. Do you know what the local square dance newspaper is all about? In our area, it's the uh, Alaman Star, the state paper is the square talk. And I tell them what all these little things along the way are. Also, do you realize we have a square dance association? We have a caller uh, association. And then over the weeks of teach, drop these little extraneous bits of knowledge of what the whole picture is about. Okay, or where, and of course, I do contra with my new dancers and give them a little short history on where square dance came from and then demonstrate and I think by knowing I, I don't like calling new dancers dogs but having trained a lot of dogs in my life <laughs> that weren't dancers the four-legged kind 
a happy dog is a trained dog. And by the same philosophy, a happy dancer is a trained dancer that knows where he came from. Thank you, Walt. One more here. I'm Rusty Wright, Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I hope I can remember everything I'm supposed to say. First of all, I'm kind of lucky to live in a particular place where I have somebody to work with. I'm sure a lot of callers here haven't ever heard of Poncho Baird. Um, but he does live in our <laughs> lives in my, my town and works with me somewhat, helps me somewhat with attitude. I had a slow couple. And in our particular part of the country where... And especially in Santa Fe, 90%, 85% of the people are Spanish-speaking. You find your dancers having problems because they have to take what you tell them, translate it into Spanish before they can do it. And I had one particular couple. I said, God, they're never going to make it. And so I went out and talked to them, and I said, you know, you guys are having a few problems, and I'd like you guys to help me. I want you to help those couples over there. They're having more problems than you are, and you guys really ought to help them. And I'm kind of glad I did. I called a dance 180 miles from Santa Fe, and I looked up, and they were in the front square. And they've made nine nationals in a row. Um, the other thing is that callers project what they really want to. Um, I don't know whether that really says it. My wife helps keep me under control. Uh, we've gone to a few dances, and you let your personality go out across that microphone to your dancers. We've danced to a couple of dancers. She says, as we on the, on the way home, that guy acts like he had a personality bypass operation. Okay? You project that out to your dancers. Um, write it down, Cal. Okay. Now, I realize a lot of callers out there have complete control of the school their square dance activity that they're involved in. Unfortunately, in our area, I'm not quite that lucky. My club comes to me and they say, you have 25 weeks to teach your class. Period. What do you do? Thank you very much, Rusty. Oh, we're getting some great input. And if you have to, some thoughts you'd like to add in a minute, I'm going to get Cal up here for some additional thoughts. We can work you in, too, because we do have the time. Uh, a couple of thoughts on angels. Um, it was brought up earlier. Uh, an angel can be an extension of your own teaching, but is not a teacher. Uh, the main job of your angel is to be in the right place at the right time and to do as much and only as much as you've taught the, the group. The, the angel is also a good means of indoctrinating the people in the right attitudes. And so if, if you have a chance to work with angels, work with them ahead of time, tell them what you expect. Uh, what we've discovered, and several of you have told us that you do the same thing, three couples is a maximum number of angels so that they're there strictly to fill squares. If there are four, there's always a chance that all four angel couples may be dancing and not the couple that's sitting on the sidelines that really needs it. Um, what is the most difficult movement in square dancing? A minute ago, we said the right and left through because it's, it's, uh, it kind of comes at a time when a person has no idea which is his left and which is his right. But there's another answer to that question. Do you know the most difficult move in square dancing? Getting them in the hall, getting them through that front door the first time. Because once you've got them in, then you've got the opportunity of selling them on square dancing. If you can't get them in, you don't have that chance. Um, a recent poll made by Legacy, which is a communications group of leadership in square dancing, uh, came out with a very interesting finding on the major concern in square dancing today. And uh, do you know what it is? What? Etiquette. Lack of etiquette. La lack of consideration. Lack of, of being able to treat people gently and humanly, and I think it's very important that the, to realize that the only way many of these people are going to, to learn a proper etiquette of working with people and enjoying each other is the way you teach them. Um, Cal, a minute ago, referred to square dancing, uh, indoctrination handbook. 
Now, the reason this was put out is because years ago, and many, how many of you have been calling more than 20 years? Good Lord. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. Any more than 25? Any more than 26? Keep your hands up. 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 30, 34, 35, 36. <laughs> oh, that, that is terrific. You'll remember that when, when we had classes 15, 20 years ago, classes, sometimes we had to struggle to go 7, 15, maybe 10 weeks because there wasn't that much in the way of basics to teach. We would teach what basics there were, and then we would work with dances and dance patterns. And so we had time to explain a little bit about those things one of the speakers had mentioned about that are important in the history and background of square dancing. But as more and more things came in, less and less time was, was given over to philosophy, to history, and to those things that are very interesting and important to being a part of square dancing. So we put a lot of those things together and just called it Indoctrination Handbook. And if you've not seen a copy, I've got a few up here and you can fight over them. And we'd love to have you take a look. Um, I think we'll get our next uh, individual from the side. A lady from the sidelines. Your name and, uh, and place, please. Dorothy Peeler from Martinez, California. Uh, we call for clubs in Benicia, California and Brentwood, California. And, and I understand Northern California is, has a different routine from other parts of the country, even Southern California. Starting in November... Uh, on Friday nights, we have what we call beginner hoedowns. And your uh, students that you started in September will be maybe about eight weeks into the course when they start going out. And every Friday night for the enthusiastic ones, and of course their dancing gets better and better. But the problem I'm addressing to our two experts here is this. I find that they're coming back to our, our workshop and telling us that we had um, spin chain through. What is that? You haven't taught that to us yet. And it's way down the list as far as I'm concerned. And so it, it becomes a problem. I do run them through it if they ask and we have time because I, I feel obligated to supply their needs. The other thing is that um, the other callers in the area are graduating their dancers into the regular club long before I think our, my dancers are ready. And I wonder if you have some answer, some solution to this problem. Thank you. With, with fewer than 10 minutes uh, left, we're getting some dynamite questions. And I know it'll take a little time. May I, are either of you addressing yourself to Dorothy's uh, question? Okay. Uh, Cal, would you like to tackle it? Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes. Please, please walk up here and let, let us have your uh, voice and name on the uh, mic. Uh, I might just say that Caller Lab has, has sort of made the way clear for many of us by making a list and an order of teaching, which is helpful. Come on and uh, identify yourself, please. Uh, Claude Seip, Camino, California again. I haven't had the pleasure of meeting Dorothy personally, although we both do call in Northern California. And I am very aware of the problem that she is talking about. And the way that I handle it personally is every workshop, I recommend a new dancer's hoedown for my new dancers to go to. I always pick a hoedown that I know the caller and I can trust what that caller is going to call. I will also talk and work with the other callers within the area and tell them, hey, they know that if my hoedown is listed as 47 basics, I am not going to call 48. I also will work the hoe down to the dance. The other callers will know this. And hopefully the other callers that I work with in the area will do the same, send their dancers to me if they feel they are qualified. If I would have a new dancer's hoe down this time of the year and somebody that has a class from the January level wanted to send their new dancers to that hoe down, I would tell them, no, this hoe down would be above what level they are dancing. And this is the way I try to handle it on a personal basis. Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you, Claude. Thank you. Uh, 
I'm afraid we're not going to be able to answer it satisfactorily, but maybe during the, uh, the course of the time that you're here, you can corner a couple callers and see what they do in situations of that type. Dorothy, I, I hate to leave you out without a complete answer. Maybe we can get a chance to get together. Uh, would you each take a crack at this? You look familiar. I remember you when you were 16. Come on up here. Bob, that goes back a few years. Identify yourself. Please. Good morning. I'm Brian Murdoch from Vancouver, B.C. I think one of the things that uh, uh, I like to find uh, and be with my dancers is to be honest with them and honest with me. At one time, I was very concerned that uh, I might have a couple in my class that square dancing wasn't really their recreation. And I can remember Lee Helsel saying at one of our caller sessions, don't be afraid to approach a couple and discuss their dancing ability. And I had such a couple in one of my classes a few years ago, and I was very concerned about their behavior in the class. We always break in the middle of our classes for a cup of coffee and try and form a circle so people get to know one another. And it always worried me that this couple preferred to sit on the outer limits or down in the corner. They were people that really enjoyed one another's company and were not mixers. I found when we had approached about February that this couple really were having difficulty with their dancers. They were strangers to the balance of the group. So I contact the, uh, contacted them one night after the dance to ask how I could assist them to being more of a member within the group. And the gentleman didn't know just exactly how to respond to me. He said that the square dancing was not coming easy. They had come to the classes because their daughter so desperately wanted them to square dance because she was having a marvelous time herself. We talked for about five minutes, and I said, well, how would you like to discuss the matter with your wife and give me a call back? The wife called five minutes later and said, I don't know how I can thank you for discussing that matter with my husband. We really are not enjoying ourselves. This is not our recreation. And we didn't know how to genuinely or honestly get out of it. You have allowed us an easy way to get out of it, you have assisted us to explain to you why we're not enjoying ourselves. It just doesn't happen to be our thing. But in future, we know how we stand with you, and maybe we'll be able to come back and dance with you at a later date. That was one thing, of being honest with a dancer. I have a gentleman that's sitting beside me in the audience, a young associate that came to me earlier this year and said, Brian, I really had a problem last night. He had a problem with a couple that had come into our class, or into his class. They had a problem with alcohol. We had noticed this for quite some time. I had experienced the same problem two or three nights earlier with two gentlemen uh, in my club that had come from a business meeting and then come on to square dancing. We were very honest with our group, explained the rules and regulations as far as we were concerned with alcohol. I shared that with my club and said, people, I cannot do it alone. This is your club, and this is a problem that we should all be aware of. But by being honest with them, and it really concerned me, how do I approach these people? I was surprised how many people came back to me afterwards and said, hey, that was fantastic. We all know exactly where we stand and where you stand. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. We've got two more, and I'll ask you to please hold it down to just a, a brief, please. Your name and uh, your... Excuse me. I'm Keith Topance, and I'm also from Utah. The thing that I would like to say, I believe the biggest fight that I have had is within myself. I'm not a Bob Osgood. I'm not a Cal Golden. And the thing that... Uh, I guess the biggest thing that I can say about myself is that I have, in the last 15 years, not lost one dancing couple because of pregnancy. <laughs> I, my, my specialty is that I work with senior citizens. <laughs> and uh, Cal Golden a moment ago said that, that there are people that cannot get up to 127 beats a minute. This is true. I work with these people. 
I would love to be calling C1 or C2, but I never let my dancers know this because my dancers cannot dance this speed. And I try to make each evening as much fun and as much enjoyment for the people that I have as if they were the C1 and C2 group. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Keith. This is Pete Sansom from Florida, formerly from London. I'd like to... Absolutely. I'd like to say something about Square Angels. I've been teaching for a number of years, and the last five years I have not used Square Angels at all. The way I do this is I can use many squares, and if I have an odd couple, I have a headset. My wife and I go down and dance ourselves. This way you don't have to have Square Angels. And the biggest problem with Square Angels is not necessarily them teaching something that they shouldn't be doing is that if there's square angels around the dancers don't listen or the new people don't listen as well as they should whereas if there are no square angels the only crutch they've got is the caller they've got to listen to him if they're going to do it one other thing I'd like to say about enthusiasm I feel I'm enthusiastic and uh, I'd like to tell you a brief little story I was calling at a convention at 9 o'clock in the morning when nobody gets up in a big hall that would dance 150, 200 squares Two squares show up, I do my tip, give my all. Next caller up is a national caller, and he puts the hand over the mic, and he says, Pete, I don't know what you're so damn excited about two squares. I said, well, Jack, I said, you don't seem to understand. I said, for you, that's a small crowd. That's the biggest crowd I've ever called to. <laughs> uh, we, we're going to close this in just a second with some words from Cal, and Cal would like you to stay after... After it's over for just a second, because he wants a couple of things off the mic. I want to thank Jim Masco from the National Square Dance Convention. Did I say something wrong? Um, for being with us. Uh, and uh, Harman Jaritzma and Charlie Proctor from the Round Dance Co uh, Round Lab for being with us. And Carl Anderson, Ellis Seip, Hey Nation, Anderson Cole Wright, Peeler Murdoch, uh, Toppins, and Sansom for all contributing today. I hope you gained something from it. And here to close us off is Cal. Once again, on attitude, not only on the stage should your attitude be fantastic, it's off of the stage. When you see people having problems, don't go back and say, Well, I see you folks having some problems here. Let me show you how to do this. Walk back and say, Hey, how's things going, folks? You're looking good. Is everything all right? And if they want it that time, it won't embarrass them. They'll ask for their help. Some people ask, what are the hardest things to get dancers to do? Very sincerely, turn a quarter, turn a half, turn three quarters, turn full, and hold hands. The first night you have that class, start teaching, turn a quarter. That's a wall, that's a wall. Turn a half, turn three quarters. You know, when you get to swing through, spin chain through, you don't have to teach anything. They already know it. The other thing is hold hands. Very difficult to get people to hold hands. Why? We don't hold hands in the United States. In Europe, everybody walks down the street holding hands. Nobody in the United States walks down the street anymore. <laughs> they're either running or they're flying or they're riding a the car. The next thing is this, be prepared. I've been teaching and calling for 35 years. I still study my lessons before I go teach it. I've got three sets of these available at all times. One in the car, one in my briefcase, and one in the bathroom. I study all the time. <laughs> the other thing is... Mr. Cole, let me tell you, I used to say train until Dr. Carl Anderson got on our staff at Callers College, and he said, Cal, edu educate would be better than train. So we need to educate our dancers, and we also need to entertain them. I'd like to close with this thought from Mr. J. Paul Myers, the president of the Motivation Institute of Waco, Texas, who at 26 was a millionaire, took his fortune, and turned it into helping other people. Here's what he says. J. Paul Myers, president of Successful Motivation Institute. A man might consider himself successful when he's paid all of his bills and out of debt and has 5000 or $50,000 in the bank. But he says that is wrong. A man is successful when he's working towards the goals he has set for himself. Success is always a journey. It's like climbing an endless chain of mountains. Climb one, then look for a taller one to reach. Reaching one goal, then setting another one is the answer. This is our closing.